Well, hi, Bob. I'm so glad to have you back on the podcast. I'm really excited to talk about your new book, Misunderstanding Freud with Lacan, Zizek, and Neuroscience. Thank you. It's good to be back. What led up to you writing this book? Well, actually, one funny thing is, like, my daughter was in, like, 10th grade psychology class, and the teacher went around the first day and asked them if they knew any psychologists, and she said, uh, Lacan, and the teacher said, I don't think that is a person. And so my daughter was very upset, you know, because her father writes about Lacan, her mother talks about Lacan, and so, like, she thought it was a common thing. But in general, I am I just listen to a lot of, like, podcasts or just read a lot of books, and I think there's just continues to be a massive misunderstanding of Freud and it really is frustrating. And I think that there's a new like learning theory talks about um, threshold concepts so that there's key concepts in every discipline or field. And it's kind of like either you understand them or you don't and that um, they're often counterintuitive. And once you grasp them, you see the world differently. And I think like this goes against the idea of kind of postmodern relativism or the idea that you know there's different perspectives different people have different viewpoints and i think that psychoanalysis has often been misunderstood or at least freud because people um don't grasp these fundamental concepts and what kind of fundamental concepts are those so i argue that there's like five basic fundamental concepts that can explain say 90 percent of psychoanalysis um uh, the pleasure principle, the reality principle, unconscious transference, and primary processes. And that already in Freud's you know early text, 1895, the project for scientific psychology that he never published, um, these five concepts are really structuring his thought and his approach both to the practice and theory of psychoanalysis. And so um, I just think it's very key. And, and these concepts also... Um, have kind of a, a way to understand them if you think about it in their purest form. So like the pleasure principle in its purest form can be understood through addiction. And so if we really want to think about addiction, we have to think about like Freud's theory of pleasure. And one of the most interesting things about it is that Freud argues that pleasure is based on the um, escape from physical and mental tension. So he posits this fundamental law of inertia that we try to use as little mental and physical energy as possible. I think this is a great way of explaining so much of our, our world today. Um, for instance, the fact that we're trying to outsource all of our physical labor and all, all of our mental labor, right, to technology, to machines, and that um, this idea that, like, people are walking around with these little computers in their pockets, smartphones, and people are spend so much time attached to them um, that they really are, you know, addicted to them, so that you can be addicted to the media, addicted to technology, and that it's often like this form of escaping tension or conflict, and fundamentally escaping our own minds. Like people don't want to reflect, they don't want to think, and so they want to spend their time immersed in media and technology. And so, you know, a little bit of, you know, media technology is a pleasure is a good thing, but when it becomes it's addictive when um, it's self-destructive and it when it undermines your social relationships, it undermines, you can't control it, you can't stop. And so I think like we've created like one of the most effective drugs possible or addictions possible. This phone that we don't really think of as an addiction or we don't think of it as a drug, but um, it's you know incredibly all pervasive now and it interferes with social relationships. It interferes with like the ability of people to sleep ability of people to focus, it interferes with education. And um, I just think they're getting just even more powerful, like through the development of virtual reality and different forms of artificial, artificial intelligence. So I think one thing like psychoanalysis, I just think is more and more like um, important and more and more helps us to understand things, but at the same time is more and more repressed um, for various reasons. So so I try to look at the different air, main areas where psychoanalysis is being um, repressed. So one is um, clearly like neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, the, just the basic idea that um, we are pre-programmed by natural selection, by biology. And so that really culture doesn't matter, education doesn't matter, clearly psychoanalysis doesn't matter. 
And the solution to every problem is basically medication. And so there's this kind of, um, I would say, uncoordinated conspiracy. I call it the government university medical pharmaceutical complex gump. And all these things lead to the same conclusion that basically we are, you know, pre-programmed by natural selection so that um, we can't control our genes and so that um, our addictions are, you know, an effect of our neurotransmitters. And so then the only solution is drugs. And so now, like I know a, a guy in town who is a psychiatrist, sees his patients like five minutes a month. Mm -hmm. And he's basically just, you know, modifying medication and, and, you know, and so, and so in all these academic theories, neuroscience and evolutionary psychology, they all lead, even if they talk about like epigenesis or some role for the environment, basically their fundamental theories is that um, everything can be explained through biology. And Freud had that tendency, like held out that tendency. Um, but, you know, he also shows like through his theory of sexuality, that unlike other animals, like our drives, our instincts are very open, right? They can be easily substituted and replaced. And that um, we're not, we have free will and we have, and we're not pre-programmed like other animals on an instinctual level. So I really want to kind of attack this idea that like we're just computers or we're just animals. And that, you know, like if we want to save humans and humanity, we have to really understand what makes us human. And I think psychoanalysis is a great way to, you know, think about what makes us different from computers and from other animals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and humans, we have gotten ourselves into some dire straits. <laughs> so we do, we do need to work on uh, focusing on how to fix all of this and saving ourselves and saving humanity. Um, and I feel like people seem to think that like, you know, computers are modeled after humans. But the thing I keep noticing is that like, it's making people think more like the computers that they've programmed rather than the other way around, you know? I mean, like the big threat now, like for education is like chat GPT, this artificial intelligence that can automatically, um, you know, put together an essay that's pretty convincing. And, and then at the same time, there's more technologies for grading, you know, these essays. And so eventually we'll just have computers generating the essays and the computers grading the essays. And then we won't need any like humans involved at all. And it seems like so many things are moving in that direction. Um, at the same time, I think that um, one reason why we deny climate change is that um, we have the virtual reality becomes stronger and stronger, like our ability to kind of escape reality becomes stronger and stronger through technology and media, that even while the world is being destroyed and our future is being destroyed, we will just, you know, prefer to live in the clean virtual reality and um, and one of the fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis is the idea of the unconscious. And I think what people misunderstand about the unconscious from a psychoanalytic viewpoint um, is that it's based on repression and repression is based on self-deception. And, and people have a very hard time accepting that idea, even psychoanalysts, therapists, and psychiatrists, that people can lie to themselves. And you know, one of the things that Lacan, I think, helps us understand is this idea of like, we're divided, right? And so that part of us knows the truth, part of us doesn't know the truth. And that we constantly lie to ourselves. And um, and so then it's easy for us to deny any problem and not deal with reality because we have this quick ability to not only deceive other people, but to deceive ourselves. And then, you know, another key concept is the primary process, which I think a lot of people misunderstand. Um, part of the primary process just like the automatic way that our our mind um, generates thoughts through substitution, a substitution, association, and displacement, which means like we have an automatic, like poetic machine in our minds, right? Because um, as Lacan points out, like metaphor is based on substitution, metonymy is based on association, and so we automatically kind of see the world on a poetic level. And what's clear, like in dreams, is everything in your dream is a symbol for something else. And so that we, once again, we don't control our own minds completely. And our mind represents things symbolically. 
and that it does not clearly distinguish between fact and fiction. And, and so psychoanalysis is one of the only fields that really kind of tries to look at this, what, what, what is the effects that we have, this kind of automatic mind that is symbolic and often irrational. And it's, I think if you want to understand like politics or culture or issues in, in intersubjective relationships, you have to really first start off with this notion um, that our mind is, uh, we don't fully control our minds. And so psychoanalysis, you know, brought this up through slips of the tongue, but also through dreams, through, through jokes, this idea that we're really not in control of our own thinking. And that what people often um, have the biggest fear about is actually their own minds, right? So um, I went to this exercise, I took students outside and I said like, just like for 15 minutes, you can't use any technology, you can't talk to anyone, you just have to be there. And then we went back to class and had them write about it. And like some students said, this is like the worst experience of my life. It was horrifying, you know, it was, it created so much anxiety. Like, and it's just like, they're just alone with their own thoughts, but they're so not used to that now. Um, and because your thoughts can lead to like scary places, you know, think about like deprivation tanks, people go to these tanks and there's no, um, you're basically floating in water in the dark. And so basically it frees up your mind. And this is exactly what happens when you go to sleep, right? There's nothing to prevent your mind from going to different places. You're not um, dealing with reality and people are afraid of their own minds. And so part of psychoanalysis is to give people the opportunity to really like encounter their own minds, right? And the, the process is, is really simple. And, and, the, and one of the big things that I write about is how so many people do not believe anymore, even psychoanalysts and therapists in free association. And part of it is people don't believe in like this idea of the neutrality of the analyst. So Freud's fundamental idea that he begins to outline in the project he talks about like critical thought is based on letting your mind go wherever it leads you. And this leads to free association. And, and so in order to, for the patient to be able to talk about anything without censoring themselves, um, it's a, the analyst has to not censor the patients, right? And so the neutrality of the analyst allows for the neutrality of the patient. The patient has to take a neutral perspective on their own thoughts and feelings. And people now see that neutrality or impartiality, which is also the foundations of modern science and modern democracy. They see it as um, a bias created by white male Europeans. And so there's a lot of attack on the notion of like impartiality and neutrality because we see like the law, for instance, supposed to be impartial, but it's also full of bias, right? And so the solution should be to try to make the law more impartial and less unbiased. But a lot of people just say, you know, condemn the law or condemn the courts because they're always going to be biased. Same thing with science. Science, yes, there's always going to be bias, but part of the idea is that you try to work against bias. You try to work against our prejudices and that you create like these social institutions, like with peer review and different processes that are supposed to work against these things. But just like psychoanalysis, people have taken on like this um, radical rejection of impartiality, of science, of objectivity, of neutrality. And a lot of this has to do with like identity politics and this idea that um, every group sees things from the perspective of their group, from their group identity. And psychoanalysis, I think, fundamentally suspends like identity and identification, especially in the psychoanalytic process of free association. So psychoanalysis is really kind of like opposed to intersectionality in the sense that it doesn't deny that like race affects people or class or gender, but from the perspective of the analyst, um, you're supposed to suspend those identities in order to allow for the free pursuit of thought, which is supposed to take you to places where you don't expect or where you don't control. And so I think there is this fundamental conflict now between a certain aspect of left-wing identity politics and psychoanalysis. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that when I think of analytic neutrality, I think of it how you described it with, um, 
you know, being neutral towards the content then comes up and not like, you know, where a regular kind of psychotherapist or psychologist might jump in with a plan or advice. The psych psychoanalyst has to maintain the position of not jumping in and allowing the person to sit with these anxieties and things that might not align with the way they see themselves because we do lie to ourselves. So a lot of things might come up that might contradict how you want to see yourself, you know, and that ties in with like the identity that we like want to believe that we have, but you might learn a lot about yourself that's, <laughs> that you don't like so much, you know, but you have to be able to let it come up to work through it and work with it and, you know, adjust how you want to. Another fundamental idea related to that is, um, so firstly, I talk about like how a lot of um, therapists, I quote a lot of people um, talking today, there's this, um, that, you know, you have to go out of your way to talk about like racial issues. If, in, if you're not, then you're, you're just exercising your white privilege. And I, and I think that the problem with that is that once again, um, you're directing the patient and, you know, Freud, I think makes this strong argument that he very often, you know, does not live up to is that you shouldn't be an educator. You shouldn't be a, like a, a parent, you shouldn't be a priest, right. And you're not the savior. And the problem is like, as he points out in the project is he says like when a baby first, you know, starts when a baby feels uncomfortable and cries um, and the parents then comes or this caregiver comes and helps make the suffering go away. The the child then learns that like the cry is a demand made to the other. And but underlying that demand is a total desire for love, recognition, and knowledge. We want, you know, we want the caregiver, the other, to um, recognize why we're crying, to understand why we're crying, and, and give us care, give us love. And so behind the demands for analysis and behind every demand to a significant other person um, is this underlying desire for love, knowledge, and recognition. And the analyst functions by not feeding that demand. And, and, and so to allow those desires to emerge, emerge and to be clarified and for the person to free associate about them. And and still, like a lot of therapists, when I hear them talking about therapy or analysts talking about analysis, um, they have, they still want to play the role of the one who knows. They still want to play the role of the one who cares and the one who recognizes everything. So they just feed the demand and they never allow this fundamental, these fundamental desires to emerge. And part of it is like, um, it's very hard to accept this idea that like, you don't have to understand your patient. You're really, your main function is to keep the free association process going, you know, which will require, you know, asking questions, what have you, but it's not about what you know. It is not about this idea like, you know, and so once you give up on this need to know or understand what your patient is saying, then that really frees up the patient. I had this experience once where a, um, this woman I was working with uh, at a clinic, she was like really like um, feeling a lot of anxiety. She said, I don't understand this patient. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I just told her, just, just listen to the words he says and just try to, you know, what, you know, don't try to understand, just listen to the words. And then she said like the next time she did that. And the next time, like he started talking about dreams and it like, because it allowed a space for the person to um, regress or to explore thoughts. And once the therapist or analyst stops trying to be the one who knows, that opens up a space for the patient to discover on their own. Because after all, someone goes to therapy or analysis because what they're doing like currently with their friends or their relationships isn't working. And, and so it offers a totally artificial form of, of communication, which doesn't exist really outside of analysis, which is like, you know, you're going to talk to me and I'm not going to judge you in any way. Right. And I'm not even going to try to necessarily, you know, care about what you say or understand what you say, but I'm going to create a space where you can say whatever you want. And it's very, you know, freeing, I think for the patients, when I started analysis in France, um, I think I had a lot of anxiety about public speaking, especially publicly speaking in French. And I did my analysis in French 
and um wow. which was good or bad i don't know what but you know it was interesting because i really had to grasp the idea like my analyst probably doesn't understand a lot of things i say right and but then like I realized, like, I taught a course in France in French, and I realized, like, I have no idea what it's like to live in French in France or grow up in the French education system or what really the culture is, you know. So it's like, it, it really, you know, by speaking in French during my analysis, first of all, I came, I overcame my anxiety about public speaking, um, which people report is like the biggest anxiety people have. Like, they're more fearful of like illness they're more fear of public speaking than almost anything right and so the question is like why is that why are people and one way of overcoming that is through analysis where you have to learn how to speak without fearing the judgment of the other or the end the judgment of yourself and that's a very freeing like exercise and experience but when i hear people talking about therapy and analysis a lot of the times especially psychiatry um there seems to be like no space for free association. People have really given up on that. And I think there's many different reasons for it, but one, one reason is they don't fundamentally understand what free association is and what neutrality is. And then Freud's theory of the reality principle, which is very tied to what Descartes says about reason. He says, in order to have, Descartes says, in order to have science, you have to suspend all, um, prejudice and bias right that's the first step and this might be an impossible ideal but it's like the foundations of modern science um and same thing with analysis the reality principle is this effort to then kind of suspend bias to susp suspend judgment prejudgments right judging beforehand and it's just very hard for people to do it's very different from the way that people normally think and interact with other people and um, and so I think that psychoanalysis, I think really is a science. It has the foundations of a science. It's impartial, it uses empirical material evidence, um, but it's become completely distorted because people misrepresent it and misunderstand it. Yeah, and, and just thinking about this, what an antidote this kind of psychoanalytic space can be to like contemporary times, because, you know, with the with the internet and the smartphones, you know, it's like people have become so passive, it feels like, where they're just like constantly consuming and ingesting like whatever's in front of them, like scrolling to TikTok or whatever. Um, and if you don't have your phone and you're just like sitting at this space, like laying on a couch, looking at the ceiling and having to like have, have your thoughts come up. I mean, there's there's really no time for that. Like, especially I'm thinking of kids like growing up with their phone and the computer and the TV all on at the same time, you know? It's like there's never any kind of quiet time where they're just allowing their thoughts to come up. It's just either like this like ingestion of content or this like anxiety, like you described the second they don't have that, you know? And, you know, when, like another fundamental concept that Freud brings up, um, and, and I really think all these concepts could be tested, like there's a way of testing, you know, all of these concepts. And so I think, sci I think psychoanalysis could be like scientifically tested some of it. Um, but one of them is Freud's belief that you basically never um, fully forget anything. Okay, this is really important and because it's at the foundation of this idea that everything returns in some way, either through a symptom, right, or a dream, or a joke, or um, a, a slip in a, a comment or something that you write. And so, like, basically, the faith that the analyst has in the process, and this is part of the reality principle, is this notion that, like, um, you can't fully escape any thought or feeling or experience that you've had, right? So everything kind of returns, the real always returns. And so um, we try desperately to escape it through many different ways, through distraction, through repression, um, through like um, relationships with other people, but like fundamentally we can never fully escape our minds. And so it's important then to give a space for us to discover our own minds and to think about our own thoughts and feelings instead of constantly trying to escape them. Um, so you, you know, recently you put together this book on Bergman, um, Ingmar Bergman, and my, um, there it is. Um, and I have a chapter where I talk about um, Hamlet and um, Bergman's film, Fanny and Alexander. And one of my main points is that um, in the film, 
Bennett, Alexander, um, the father is putting on the play Hamlet and is playing the role of Hamlet's ghost. And so there's just all these references to ghosts, to Hamlet, to Shakespeare throughout the film. But also like the film in almost every scene, this is what at first really attracted me to that movie was like, um, not only do they comment like that we're all like actors on a stage, but almost every scene is framed with like curtains, like visually, um, this idea of trying to turn like everyday life into theater and what is the relationship between theater and everyday life. And um, I think this is um, really interesting. I think what most people don't get about say Shakespeare's Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, and I think it's kind of picked up by Bergman in a way, is not only this idea that we're all actors, right? But that Hamlet itself in the play puts on a play and in the play, Hamlet acts as Shakespeare. He acts as a theater director and a theater writer and he's directing people and he's telling people and he's and he he's also presents his theory of Hamlet presents his theory of theater or Shakespeare's th theory of theater, which is that he says um, he's going to put on a play. The play is the thing that will catch the conscience of the king. So this is idea that theater has this ethical dimension, right? And that somehow um, by reproducing symbolically the murder of Hamlet's father, it's going to um, catch the conscience, trigger the conscience, the guilt of the murderer, Claudius, his uncle. And, you know, if you think about the most famous speech in um, like English literature, you know, the to be or not to be speech, the speech is really about psychoanalysis. It's about the fact that when you go to sleep at night, you dream. The reason why he doesn't want to kill himself is because of purgatory and his father is walking around in purgatory. But then purgatory becomes in the 16th century, it becomes more secular. This idea that just like in purgatory, you're being judged by God, every in your unconscious, you're also being judged by your conscience, by your superego. And that when you dream, this idea is, and this is similar to that Freud's idea that you can't erase totally your memories or your thoughts, you can't really escape your own guilt and your own shame. So when you go to sleep at night, often you have like anxiety dreams. And in those anxiety dreams, um, you experience your, your you, a feeling of guilt or shame, often in a symbolic way. And the same thing happens then in art, can happen in art, can happen in theater, can happen in film is this idea of symbolically representing what we're trying to escape. And what we're often trying to escape is our feelings of guilt and shame. And so there is this ethical dimension to art, but also to the unconscious, this idea that as much as we try to escape through repression, our feelings of guilt and shame, those feelings always return. And so second says, then you should like confront them and deal with them and acknowledge them instead of constantly trying to um, escape them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yours is one of my favorite pieces in this book. So thank you for it. <laughs> I love it. It's a great collection. And I love, I'm very much uh, as an editor, I don't like to censor different people's thoughts. I like people to say, be able to say whatever they have to say, just like an analysis. Um, so it's always fun to me to see like, like, uh, like sometimes when people would edit something like this, for example, they would want like people to everyone do a different film. But I like to see what two people might say about the same film because they often see really radically different things. And sometimes, you know, I've watched all of these films. I watched Fanny and Alexander again over Christmas this year. It was fun. Uh, it's such a beautifully shot film. Um, but I ended up thinking just about how what a projective surface film really is and how like so, like like someone wrote about the silence for example and it's like what he saw in it is like like did we even watch the same movie you know <laughs> it's like so radically different than my take for example on the movie but that's what that's another point you talked about transference there's so much like transference and projection going on all the time you know but I have this I mean I'm, a, I'm like a modern enlightenment like person like I still believe that there is like a correct and wrong interpretation. I really do. Like in the sense like, so like, uh, like Hamlet, if you don't understand that it's a metafiction, that it is um, theater about theater and that Hamlet is a stand-in for Shakespeare and Claudius is a stand-in for the audience. If you don't get that initial frame, right? There's no way any, that you're going to be interpreting 
anything like correctly. There's a lot of other stuff going on, but if you don't start with that initial frame, if you take things like straightforward, and, and I notice this a lot, like I'm teaching our course now on comedy and film, film and comedy. And, and students write papers about different contemporary comedies. And what I notice is like, if they don't start off with realizing that comedy often has an ironic structure where you're saying one thing, but you're also unsaying what you're saying, that it has all these disclaimers that you can say like offensive things because you um, say, oh, it's just a character. Oh, it's just a joke, what have you. And this ties into Freud's theory of the way that jokes work is that I give the audience pleasure and in, re and in return, they promise not to hold me responsible for what I'm saying. So that comedy allows me to escape from a sense of responsibility, and then from guilt and shame or ethics or what have you, or criticism. Um, but if students don't start off realizing that the shows the, or the movies that they're analyzing have like an ironic frame, then they're only looking at part of it. Like, so they'll like say, oh, the film is full of prejudice, right? But it's also mocking that prejudice and commenting on how we respond to prejudice. And so it's doing multiple things. But if you only look at it as, oh yes, this film is just, presenting prejudice or this film is just like undermining prejudice. No, it's doing both things at the same time. Like another example, like I have like, I have these like books that I'm constantly thinking I'm gonna write, but I never do. Cause like they're too Is large. Is you too busy writing other books? <laughs> they're too large a project or no one's gonna read them anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But um, like Hegel, like if you don't understand like phenomenology of mind or spirit, um, that it starts off with a preface and in the preface they say like he writes um, there's no reason to have a preface right because you know like and, and then it's full of disclaimers and and if you don't understand that actually the entire book is ironic because he's constantly um, basically undermining he's er everything he's saying and showing like everything becomes doubled and everything is self-reflexive and like a meta-narrative and so if you don't understand like the, the ironic frame of it, then it doesn't matter how you interpret any other passage. You have to first start off with the ironic frame. And I think that's really important. Like this idea that Lacan says between what's actually stated, the statement and the enunciation or the, the enunciation, like the, 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 the attitude towards what's being said, right? And so if you don't understand the attitude or the frame or the mood, right? Then like nothing's gonna really, you know, connect to the original um, because the frame, it's like a mathematical equation. It's like what's outside the parentheses. The frame is going to determine the rest of the equation. And so you have to, if you get the frame, the initial frame wrong, I think there's no way of you understanding things. And so I think there is a right, and wrong way of interpreting like the frame or the genre or the effect of irony. Um, yeah. So that's, so a lot of people hate that idea because they think, oh no, there's multiple ways. Each reader has their own interpretation. No, like um, that's kind of like too dogmatic. It's totalitarian. Um, why it's too narcissistic why you know how do you know that you're right that's you know but I think you have to like um, you have to have evidence for it but you have to like come up with some type of um, perspective that you're transparent about and and you have to um, yeah and it's not just open to every interpretation everything can't be open to every interpretation which makes it be being a teacher kind of difficult, you know, like you, you say something in class and you ask a question, like I teach in a very like dialogical way. And so it's, it's very hard because students, first of all, a lot of them are very afraid of publicly speaking and it's a small class and they're used to being invisible in large classes. Um, but another thing is like, well, they don't want to speak because they're afraid of being shamed. So then what do you do if someone says something that you think is really like off? like as a teacher respond and what do you do in an interview if you think someone says something that is really um off or wrong or misinformation do you feel it's just not your job to like 
interact with that or I mean to counter that or yeah I try to just pull out the pieces that I like that I want to hear more about because right. <laughs> I no, really I don't know I think it's just the analyst debate that's my main position and I don't feel like I'm here to like argue with people about the points that they want to make you know they're entitled to their thoughts and opinions you know no no totally and I, I you know it's interesting um another thing that I'm working on now this book's coming out I think in a few months it's called um uh political what's it called political pathologies from sopranos to succession so I want to it's about prestige tv and at first it's really interesting because you know I was telling my students you know hopefully when you write it is like analysis like you discover new things right and that you, if you let yourself go, and I think this is also with creativity, right? It re, it requires this um, ability to suspend judgment, to um, allow your mind to go to places where you don't intend, and to not you know cut off your thought because it's um, you're talking about something that's uncomfortable, or you're talking about something that you're not completely sure of um, when. Freud is first talking about free association. I think it's in the interpretation of dreams. Um, he he re references, I think it's Schiller. And he talks about the need for the creative artists not to censor themselves and to be able to explore um, paths of thought that they don't know where they're going to end up. And I think a lot like, so when I was writing this book about success, about um, uh, prestige TV, I really didn't know where it was going to end up. And and I had never really read a lot of Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and one of his main arguments, which really shaped my book, is that um, that basically people um, consume different cultural objects as a way of signaling their class status. And that um, this whole idea of cultural capital. But in Prestige TV, it's very interesting. Like there's an intentional strategy by HBO to differentiate its product from mass TV, um, especially because it had to ask people to pay for these expensive subscriptions, which was a new thing. And so I had to basically say, you know, their slogan was, it's HBO, it's not TV. So what were the strategies that it used to signal its um, status as not being mass culture, mass television? Nudity. <laughs> so there's one aspect of, and this is because they were, they were covered by different laws by the federal, by the FCC. So they could have, you know, more nudity, violence, profanity. Um, but the paradox of prestige TV is often people see it as both more realistic, but also more artistic. And you think about art, like fundamentally the word art comes from like artificiality, fakeness. So like, how can something be hyper real, but also hyper fake, hyper artistic? And you see that it creates this ironic structure because you have this idea that we're accessing, you know, life as it really is in an authentic way. If people are uncensored or people can really express their drives or, you know, act on their sexual or violent tendencies. Um, but it's highly stylized. And I think that that signals this kind of contradiction of like the upper middle class aesthetics, which is that, in one way, um, it wants to show its kind of moral virtue, signal its moral virtue, um, but it also wants to um, pursue its own pleasure, its own pleasure principle, its own drives. And so this creates this kind of contradictory structure where you have this kind of highly stylized art, but it's basically representing like our most basic, like fundamental human drives anti that are often antisocial. And I think the and I, I think it reflects on this idea of on one hand, um, so Bourdieu's argument is basically art also is a way of um, upper middle class or wealthy people signaling that they don't have to care about like working or necessities or they can splurge, they can be gratuitous and because they have the time and the money. And so it's a way of signaling like class privilege. And that these shows, like, you know, they have, like, attention to detail, but also they have all of these artistic devices that not only signal excess, but also um, create, like, an aesthetic distance so that 
you might be watching violence and, you know, and people mistreating other people, but you're doing it from an ironic position because you're constantly being, re being reminded that this is art and therefore it's artificial and therefore it's indifferent in some ways. And so I think that um, Prestige TV has this very interesting thing. It tried to cater to the upper middle class at the same time, like at least in the United States, but I think throughout different parts of the world, like the Democratic Party, for instance, switched from trying to really focus on working class, middle class, to be focused on upper class, upper middle class or upper class professionals. And I think that there is the same idea of like what people in a lot of politics, what the right really cashed in on was um, that the the Democrats really abandoned the working class. And so the right tried to, and pretty successfully in a lot of cases, especially white working class, um, was to bring them over to, to the right by showing like the hypocrisy, say, of the Democratic Party, that they abandoned really the workers, that really they're a party of the upper middle class. And I think like these prestige TV shows actually really reflect this notion of like the upper middle class values, aesthetics, and um, and that it's kind of based on this kind of contradiction or hypocrisy or irony, where on one hand they have to people in the upper middle class have to claim that they're they're um, they care about other people that they have to signal their virtue right they have to you know have drive Teslas or whatever or and have their organic bags and like signal their social concern at the same time um, they're focused on their individual pursuit of profit and privilege and power and so um, I think that these shows kind of reflect on this fundamental contradiction and ambivalence that they turn to these anti-heroes that both express their fundamental anti-social desires but also do it from a perspective of like moral virtue like so Tony Soprano is not just a um, criminal um, who acts on his sexual and violent drives but he also goes to therapy and he also has to constantly articulate like not you know his relationship to his drives um, Breaking Bad you know it's not just you know the character becomes a criminal but is constantly you know reflecting on the moral choices that he's making and the show comments on the moral choices. So it's not just like, it's just not like, um, like old Westerns in the United States. Like I went through a period, I watched all these old Westerns. It's really funny because they're really about like men going out and just doing whatever they want. And like being free of women, being free of, of morality and culture. And this idea of there's a free space for men to act on their selfish drives, right? And that the law is always a problem and it has to intervene or women are always a problem. They try to subdue the men or control them. And, um, but there wasn't a lot of like, like these mixed ambiguous anti-heroes, but now we have all these characters are, are they're, you know, they're anti-heroes, they're heroes, but they're, we, so we have all this guilty pleasure. Like we enjoy them, we live vicariously through them, but we also condemn them. And I think that's like the, upper middle class centrist democratic psychology is that it um, that we all have this divided guilty pleasure that we're invested in all these activities and in some ways we think are immoral or wrong and so that we have to make up from them for them by signaling our virtue to other people yeah, yeah the liberals as they would call them right <laughs> yeah but they're not really really trying they're just signaling that they're trying <laughs> yeah and I, I think the big problem is is that um like this very good book called the 9.9 percent .9 by matthew stewart um his main argument is is that the upper middle class um the 9.9 percent .9 not the 0.1 percent but the 9.9 percent .9 um they control basically all of our fundamental institutions now um, but they're always taking advantage of inequality. 
while trying to signal their virtue. And so like they always wanted to make sure their kids go to the best colleges, the most selective colleges. So like higher education is supposed to be like the solution to our economic social problems. But higher education is incredibly stratified, right? It's incredibly stratified. So it actually statistically increases um, inequality and decreases social mobility on the whole. Now there's mm -hmm. exceptions, but, and so, um, and housing, the same thing. Uh, upper middle class takes advantage of like the housing market in order to turn a, a huge you know, profit on housing while it ends up, they're taking advantage of inequality because most people you know, can't afford housing or go into massive debt for their housing. Um, and so like um, the same thing with politics is that politics becomes this domain of really taking advantage of inequality. And so, um, and still like at universities, universities all the time talk about like, you know, how they're so virtuous, how they believe in diversity, equality, inclusion, what have you, but they are like fundamentally machines of inequality. And so I think like, like no one's more obsessed by hierarchy and inequality, you know, hierarchy than like professors, you know, assistant professor, full professor, you know, and, mm. um, and then you look at it, well, most of the people now in higher education, like, are part-time faculty with no job security and no role like in shared governance. So it's like, you know, talk about like a, a, uh, an exclusion of the, the people from democracy. Most of the faculty now have no participation in the fundamental like government of the university. And yet these universities like to present themselves as these bastions of liberal virtue. And so we see that throughout the culture that um, and I think the the left the right has taken advantage of that because it takes advantage of that hypocrisy, and and it's it attracts people that feel that they've been abandoned or forgotten by the liberal establishment. Yeah, it's a huge problem. I've been thinking about that a lot lately with the academia and the university and how it's like they're just like giant corporations at this point you know they're big businesses but the fact that they keep like trying to present this facade about like helping people and being of higher learning and critical thinking when they're just they're, they're only concerned about the bottom line as well you know right i always wonder like in sweden like our countries you know the scandinavian countries it's very funny like whenever i meet someone from sweden it's just coincidence they're almost always like these extreme right-wing people and it's funny because on one hand, you have this idea that these Northern European countries or Scandinavian countries, you know, they have so much better of a social welfare policies and people tend to have a more of a belief in these social policies than in, in our countries. But there are still like left right wing like movements in these countries that are, I don't know how big they are. And, you know, I don't know if like, um, like the current election in Sweden, I I don't know if like if that at all compares with like what happened with Trump and stuff. But um, I still think it's it's much smaller of a amount of the electorate which is like very right wing in these skin. I assume, right? Yeah, it's like a, the moderate, the middle, the moderates and the right got together and made a coalition so that they, they ended up getting the majority. Uh, but not by too much, but still it happens. Um, but an interesting thing, like I learned recently, like Swedish, like colleges and universities, they don't have like football teams and things like that. Like sports are not associated with them at all, which is interesting. Like they're, they're com completely just like run by the government and kept separate from all those kinds of money making things. But then again, I guess, I don't know, because the sports are often how people are able to get into college. But I get if, if the colleges are covered anyway then then you don't need those kinds of incentives i don't know now that you go into the school like i've had this long battle with different universities that i've been at like the bookstore at, at where i teach at university of california santa barbara like there's no books in it and i think it fundamentally sends the message to the students that you know they have actually the books in the in the basement there are some books but that like education is not a priority here and I think so much of the university sends that message that, you know, it takes on all these different activities and stuff. Um, but education itself is usually like very low down on the list. And you see that like, you know, they they have huge classes, they have underpaid part time faculty and graduate students and all these interns and stuff like that. Um, they they don't put money into actually, you know, education 
And um, it's just put into all these other things like athletics and the facilities and the research programs. So um, and once again, it's kind of like, I think the big problem with like what we might call liberalism or I would call centrism is that, um, so one hand, like whenever I talk to a lot of professors, they always blame the problems on like the state's not giving us enough money or there's these evil administrators, but it's like the, the professors themselves um, took advantage of their position and basically um, did not protect like the public mission of the university and gave up a lot of their like power to the administration. And then, but they, I think it's part of the, the centrist kind of like, I call it like liberal narcissism is like, they don't want to accept that they play any role. So they always have to find someone else's at fault. And so things never get fixed at the university um, because no one really looks at what is the cause of the problems or and what even the problems are because no one wants to feel like they're uh, part of this of a bad system. And so people constantly, um, I'll tell you one other story. Like, so I was working on free public higher education. You know, I wrote this book about it and then I got invited to come to the White House several times and I worked with the Obama administration on a program for free college. And um, one of the things like I, I pointed out in my research was that you know, over like 40 years, the United States spent like $2 trillion of trying to make higher education more affordable and accessible. And the absolute opposite happened. And so like, how is that possible? Like how could politicians keep on pushing these policies that have the absolute, the, the opposite of what they were intended? And I think a part of it is like, it's just like people want to like, believe in these policies, like education is a solution to every problem. But also once there is evidence that it's not the solution, they don't want anyone, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to, so they can't fix problems. Same thing like our foreign policy or our aid in Africa. Like even though we had such evidence that those aid policies failed, we still like double down on that. It's because part of being like a, a liberal narcissist is you can't um, accept any type of criticism because you're so invested in um, being seen as being good because fundamentally you want to believe that you're good. And so you're invested in, in wanting to be good. And so like, like you have something like Facebook, all people do is like basically post images or stories about how good they are, how good looking they are, how competent they are, how they, they, they're part of this good cause. And the, the idea of obsessional narcissism that I think Freud presents is like, well, people want, need to have their goodness recognized by other people because they don't actually fundamentally believe they're good, but they need to find a way to believe that they're good. So they need other people to recognize their goodness. And so virtue signaling is a way of people to escape their own sense of guilt and shame and to um, basically have people recognize their good intentions. And the problem is, though, once there is a problem or these policies fail, they can't fix them because that would just bring shame or guilt. Okay, that was another tangent, but. The good guy badge. <laughs> yes. Everybody likes to have their good guy badge. <laughs> so like I'm an e equal opportunity critic, you know, I, I really try to critique the right, critique the left, critique conservatives, critique centrist liberals, which means like, no one likes me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's good. You should be able to critique all, all sides. That way you're actually critically thinking. <laughs> possibly, possibly. <laughs> Not just in invested in your uh, specific identity focus. Focus the thing that you've narcissistically invested in. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you want to stop with that? Yeah. Why don't we stop with that? And uh um, I have some uh, YouTube videos if you want to check it out where I try to talk about like the basic concepts of psychoanalysis and I'm, I'm hoping to do like more stuff like that because, you know, you write books and then it's really up to you to try to like promote them, I guess. And a lot of academics, we're not used to promoting and you know, doing that stuff, but I think it is, if you want to get your thoughts out there and interact with people. Um, I think it's really important to do. So that's like, like your show, I think is really important because, you know, it gets a lot of books out there and people can, I buy a lot of books because I listen to your podcast. So 
spent a lot of money Me on too. this. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I ended up with well, a lot of it's really of important books. to have these public <laughs> forums to discuss these kind of like uh, sometimes difficult ideas and um, especially psychoanalysis because I do think it's it's increasingly important and increasingly um, repressed and like um, debased. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why I even try to make the podcast space kind of psychoanalytic in that way where other people kind of start where they want and free associate and follow their chains of thought. Because even sometimes I notice like psychoanalysts or people interested in psychoanalysis aren't used to doing that, you know, they don't have a space for that all the time either. So you kind of just like see what comes up and yeah, see where the chain of thought goes, follow the associations, you know. It's much more fun that way. I like to live in that space as much as possible. Yeah. (laughs) 